So first, I knew you as a mechanical engineer who enjoyed doing, uh, you know, who enjoyed a bunch of creative pursuits. Right. How did you get from there to being a game designer? Okay, so if you want to go all the way back, right? I mean, even as, as a kid, like I always liked playing games, right? Whether it was board games, video games, sports, which I consider like a very important form of gaming as well. Um, I was always into semi-competitive means of having fun, right? Just just playing around, right? That was a very very compelling activity. Uh, for me back then and throughout. It's probably the, the most consistent hobby I've had throughout my life. And in my last final years of uni, I started getting exposed to more formal uh, theories of, of this hobby, right? Like how games actually design. I started becoming aware of gaming as more than just a hobby, right? It's yeah. something that I realized that, oh, it's something people actually design, people actually come up with rules, people actually figure this stuff out. It's not that I wasn't aware of it before, but I was more aware, right? Yeah. That, that this is something people could actually do. I actually started thinking about it. And um, as you mentioned, because the creative uh, sciences or arts were always more interesting to me in college than mechanical engineering. Um, I was always into design and always into, you know, just making stuff. So when I got done with the uni, I knew that I didn't want to do any of the engineering jobs. I didn't want to do any of the banking jobs. I wanted to do something fun and creative. I was actually looking at teaching, in fact, as a, as a, as a possible um, career choice because that seemed to give me the most flexibility to do things. But Fortunately, a job landed on my lap, which was at this place called Logic Mills, where they were trying to merge the fields of education and gaming and game design to develop um, classroom activities in the form of games to teach critical thinking and, and mm -hmm. uh, analytical skills. So when I joined them, again, my game design knowledge got more and more formalized. And yeah, I learned a lot more about, you know, mechanics of games and the anatomy of game design and things like that, which complemented my more intuitive uh, creative skills I had back then. And from there, I met my uh, partner and co-founder of Lambda Mu. And when the iPhone industry phenomenon started booming, we uh, spun off from Logic Mills and started our own uh, game development company, which is Lambda Mu. Excellent. So, so the next one, the big one was, so how did you make that transition to somebody who played games, to thought about games a bit? And I remember you had the story of, you know, you used to play a whole bunch of board games every night. I'd love to understand sort of that transition. Sure. Um, so I think what was really valuable for me, right, um, yeah, which I think maybe is not something that a lot of other people experience, was my ability to teach people how to play games. So I think that was the first step. Right? Okay. Uh, so first was, for some reason, I have a really good memory for rules. Right? So it started with you know, more rote-based learning before understanding. Right? So yeah. you just remember all the rules really well. So every time you're, the game is being played with someone's doing something wrong, you're like, no, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. Right? Uh, because you remember the rules. And then slowly that translates the more rules you keep thinking about, the more you keep repeating them, right? Then after a while there's only so much you can remember, right? Yeah. So you slowly start to see patterns in your head, like, wait, that doesn't make sense that this should be the, the way this this rule works, right? Yeah. And then you go and verify look at the rule book and it's like, yeah, that's not that's not it, right? So slowly from repetition and from memory it starts becoming intuition, understanding, they start reflecting and start thinking, oh why was this made this way? Right? And the more games I got exposed to and when people start teaching me games, even though I'd never seen the game before, I'd never heard the rules of the game before, this is when I started getting exposed to board games, when someone would teach, teach the rules and we start playing it, and it would just feel wrong, right? And, like, and, and when they, you know when they tell you that, oh, you, and you can only play these many cards, and then you throw these cards away, like, that just doesn't seem balanced, right? And that, or it doesn't seem like a fair mechanic. 
and then I'd just slink off to the side while they explained explain the rest of the rules, pick up the rule book and go and check and like, yeah, he's explaining it wrong, that's not the way it's supposed to happen. Yeah. Right? And that's how you build that knack for understanding how game mechanics work. Yeah. And again, so that was very intuitive, like you still didn't know why. And um, so when I started to learn, I learned a lot of understanding how games work by teaching them, right? Because then you also understand how people who are the end target, who are the recipients of that experience, yeah. interact with the with the system that you're designing, right? So yeah. if you can't, if, you, if the people can't understand how the game works, then it's not a well-designed game, yeah. right? Yeah. So through teaching, I understood like, you know, what kind of games, maybe they're great games from a design perspective, but not from a practical implementation okay. perspective, right? Okay. So this game is hard to teach people. This game people understand really quickly. This game people, yeah. I, I need to figure out another way. So that builds your communication skills as well. Yeah. So now when you're building a video game, you not you don't just worry about designing good mechanics, but presenting them, right? Yeah. How is the experiential aspect going to be? Like when the user gets the game in the hand, how quickly is he going to be able to grasp the concept? Yeah. And I think that those many, many years of just volunteering and then professionally also teaching kids and adults and all kinds of people, family and everybody, how to play games factored into my own ability to design those mm -hmm. experiences that are now easier for them to understand. So, so what are some of the principles, or what are some of the things a good game designer needs to have? Um, a good game designer skills, yeah. needs to have. Okay, so this is, um, this is probably not an exhaustive list, right, but just off the top of my head, Okay, exposure to as many games as possible okay. first, so you need pretext, right? As much of knowing what's out there, right? Just like a good author, ideally you should have read lots of books himself, just to see all the different styles that are there, broaden your horizons, see what are all the different elements you can use and combine, find inspiration and things like that, one. Then two, so that's, that's, that, that's one of the most obvious ones, yeah. right? But it's probably the least, it's necessary, but not at all sufficient, sufficient yeah. right? The next thing you need, because you're going to realize that a game is an experience, yes. right? You're creating an experience for a person. And it's very hard to create an experience for other people if you haven't had experiences yourself. Mm. So you need to go out there and try and do as many things as possible, see as many things as possible, read as many things as possible, watch TV, movies try things, food, read about history, literature, because inspiration for a game can come from anywhere, right? Mm. And you know, even things like psychology is such an important field to be mm. well-versed in because then you're understanding behavior and things like that. So a really, really broad exposure to as many subjects and fields and experiences as possible. Mm. Okay, so those are, so that really helps the design angle. Yeah. Another practical angle, really good communication skills. Okay. Both for uh, whether, unless you're working solo, that you probably maybe don't need communication in a team environment, right? But if you're not, if you're just if you're working in a team, then you have to be able to communicate your ideas to other people in the team. And even if you're working solo, eventually you have to be able to communicate your ideas to your yeah. uh, end user. Yeah. So that's probably the trifecta of it. Play lots of games, have lots of experiences, and be a good communicator. Cool. So now, because of the way, so firstly, you said the App Store came and exploded. So, right. so I think a couple of things. What, 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 what was it that was such a game changer? And of course, there's the obvious fact that anybody could go out and put something out there. Uh, but, but I also think that probably there's some dynamic of the publishing houses lost a little bit of power in the process, right? Uh, what what changed? What happened? What if, what is? How is this? Uh, you anyway, know, there's been an explosion. There's a lot of people designing games. Very few people making money. Uh, so how how do you see this whole thing working out? Do you see, um, you know, a huge explosion and then a lot of people getting out of the business? Uh, what's what's been the dynamic so far? I see. Okay, I think the explosion's already happened, right? And. It hasn't started contracting at all. If you're talking about in terms of bubbles, yes. it's just expanding and expanding and expanding, okay. right? And I think you identified it correctly. The, the, the first part was just the fact that um, it was developing was made very accessible, yeah. one. And so if you look at the whole production line, right, getting in the startup cost right, yeah. was minimal, right? Yeah. And equally importantly, the delivery cost was completely removed, right? So from 
author to consumer, there was only one step in the middle, as opposed to having like a dozen different steps, yeah. right? So that was that was the critical part, which is the obvious part. You see now though that the market is is getting so saturated, right? So you have your traditional model, maybe from let's say twenty years ago, if you were a game developer, yeah. you would because developing a game costs so much money, yeah. you would work at for a studio, right? Yeah. Um, maybe owned by a big publisher, where you would design the game, then you would need somebody to manufacture the game, which means print them on a CD, mm. put the CD in a box, put the box in a cardboard box, ship the box to, uh, to a warehouse, yeah. a warehouse to a distributor, a distributor to a retailer, yeah. retailer to a person, right? Yeah. And at every single point, you're, uh, somebody's taking a card, yeah. right? Yeah. So the percentage used to be like single figures that the author would get at the end of the day. Then Apple came, cut that all out, and came in with 70% to the author. Yeah. Right? Almost 10 times what they would be seeing earlier. Yeah. That was the game changer. Right? So... So you love Apple uh, as a result for, for doing that? Yeah. I, I mean, what's not to love, right? And everybody else is following that model. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty fair. I and mean, they're making a truckload of money out of it, right? Yeah. But the money that developers are, ma are making as well, they would never have seen that kind of. Yeah. It's just that that money is split amongst thousands and millions of developers and that little 30% is taken always by Apple. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which is, I mean, they came up with this, good for them. Yeah. Right? So, but what's happening now is because the market is so saturated, right? Yeah. It's so hard to get visibility. Yeah. Right? Again, for an indie person to come in, I compete against the millions of apps coming out yeah. every week, right? Um, you can't throw all that money behind uh, marketing. You may not have all the press contacts. You may not even have that much experience because it's your first time, so you don't know exactly how this now slightly maturing market, actually it's not even mature, like every, you have no, no, no idea what's gonna be successful, like a, a yeah. happy bird coming yeah. in and, yeah. you know, Taking the, everything by storm, but there are some things that you know you, people have learned over the over the, over the last few years. So that's why you're seeing it now approach a slightly traditional model a little bit more, like with a publisher coming in. Yeah. Right? So now there's one more middleman between the uh, developer and the publisher, and that sorry, the developer and the customer, consumer, which is the publisher, and their role is now to help you with those aspects, which are going to becoming difficult because the market's no longer manageable size for an indie person to navigate. So, so, so you've been working with Chilingo, which is EA's uh, subsidiary. subsidiary. Yeah. So what, is, what, has been, what, are, what are the kind of things that they do for you that really add value? Right. Um, on the production level, right, uh, they give us a lot of valuable feedback on during our development process based on their experience and on uh, their understanding of the market, so which is extremely valuable, right, to just have qualified, knowledgeable, and experienced people, you know, giving you constant uh, inputs on how to improve your game. Yeah. Uh, so that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect is, again, being established and being credible. They have great uh, media and uh, press, uh, mm. okay. uh, press contacts or press resources. So this year was great for us. Like, we've been publishing indie uh, until last year, right? And each game we did did incrementally better. Uh, how many games was that? About four or five, right? Yeah. Each game that we did did better, both in terms of uh, critical recognition, press uh, reach, and uh, revenue as well, right? Yeah. But the the jump from our most our penalt our second most recent game and the most recent game, which Lingo, was much higher. Yeah owing to the game itself as well, but also the fact that we had this relationship, the fact that on our own we could probably reach most of the top mobile gaming sites and get them to feature us and, and they have reviewed our games pretty uh, well. Yeah. But with Chilingo, right, we, for the first time we had um, acknowledgement and great reviews from one tier higher sites which are broader, which don't just cover mobile games, but yeah. all gaming like IGN and Kotaku. Yeah. Then we were on a couple of big Mac sites as well. Okay. Right? So that's definitely one of the advantages. Cool. So now you, you, you've obviously gone from two people trying to make games to a 12 people team, completely bootstrapped, uh, as the, or, or more or less bootstrapped. And, and it would be good to get a sense of the big uh, learnings that have come through, through that process of uh, expanding sort of from 
just one, as you said, one developer, one uh, one game designer to to this big team. Well, it's it's not that big yet. Yeah, yeah, but it's definitely a lot uh, larger than when we started started out, which has its benefits and challenges as well. Like you know, more pipelines to manage, definitely running or being an indie developer and being a of startup is not going to be easy, right? The odds are always stacked against you. Yeah. Right? And that can be very, very daunting a lot of the times, especially when the chips are down, right? But I'm a very, personally, I'm going to speak for myself, yes. right? I'm not going to speak on behalf of a company or anybody yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm a very product-driven person, right? So, and I think that that's the company as well, I can say. We're definitely uh, product driven too. And if there's anything we've learned is that you have to keep focused and keep believing in your product, right? Believing in your process, right? The process and the product actually. And you're gonna keep trying, right? You just you, you cannot give up if this is something that you believe in, if something you're really passionate about, right? I think that's on the very like meta soft level. Yeah. Right? That's even when you know because of unfortunate events or just bad uh, circumstances, your servers are crashing or your games, you know, or something else released on the same weekend as you did. Right? Yeah. And you can't give up, right? Just gonna keep calm and carry on, right? And and just keep going at it, and. Um, yeah, and if your product is good, if your process is good, if your motivations are true, right, you will you will uh, come out with something good at the end. So the most important thing for us, right, as a company and as uh, developers is we want to make something we are proud of. Right? Yeah. That's the first thing. If you don't make something that even you are proud of, right, then you, there's no point in doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And that, at least for us, right, we don't want to be doing stuff that doesn't make us happy mm -hmm. because that has to be the starting point, right? And then the next is translating that into into something that can also make you rich. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a little bit about process. So what do you do to make sure it's not just a product but a but a repeatable process? Right. Um, so we invest a lot in our people, right? We we hire a lot of uh, kids who maybe young and inexperienced, right? But, uh, and that comes with its own uh, set of challenges, right? You might not always have everything running smoothly from the uh, get -go. Uh, from the get-go, right? Um, that can be quite frustrating at times, quite disillusioning at times also because things are not just going the way you want, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is you don't want things to go the way you want, to go the way you want just now, just because everything worked, well, fortunately, yeah. right? You want to build a, a team and a process who's, who can reliably and uh, consistently perform at a incrementally better and better and better level. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So making mistakes, screwing things up is inevitable, right? And you just have to treat that in the positive light, which is that's very, very valuable experience that you, you picked up. Yeah. And the next one is going to be even better, right? Mm -hmm. And if the next one is better, but it also fails at some levels, great. The next one's going to be even better. Right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to just keep telling yourself that. And and not just not just keep telling yourself that, but making that happen, right? So every time there's a crisis, there's a failure, or there's, a, or there's something that, that, that's gone wrong, it's not about, oh, going to hindsight, oh, we should have done this, we should have yeah. done that, right? It's about finding out what went wrong, right? And let's make sure we just lost $10,000 on this screw up, right? Yeah. Let's get $10,000 of education out of it. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, fair enough. And so what, what are some of the things you do to stay productive? I mean, it must be pretty chaotic and uh, and obviously you also have to balance managing people and designing games. So what are, what are some of the things you do to stay productive? Uh, to stay productive? I mean, there's a lot of hacks that we keep trying, right? And actually, that itself 
is a productivity tool because by changing up the work process yeah. every now and then, right, for like six months at a standing desk, right? yeah. and that was fun because it makes work interesting again because you have a new challenge to work with. Yeah. Then another six months you try something else, you yeah. try something else. So I think one of the latest things that we tried that we picked up from another company that we were working with, right, and we saw them do that in their office and we decided to try it out here. And that uh, was, yeah, yeah. So everybody has one of these Justice League characters on okay. the table, okay. right? And um, because, again, we work, because of the nature of our job, like sometimes we can be very like immersed in what we're doing, yeah. right? And so we get into a zone where yeah. you want to finish something before you move on to something else. But also because collaborative people need your time from time to time. So what we have is everybody has this and now we know who's who, right? Yeah. So if somebody wants someone else's time, they take their, uh, their character, yeah. go to that person's desk and leave it on their desk. Nice. Right? And then the person can respond immediately or if they don't respond then you just go back to your desk and when that person finishes that task they look at the people who are waiting for them and then go back to their tables and talk to them. And I find this really useful for me especially because my time is is asked for a lot because since I'm the yeah. main designer, right? yeah. so a lot of times people need to ask me different things. And Sometimes I just tell them that, okay, I'll, I'll come back to you later, yeah. and then I forget to yeah. the yeah, they've been just waiting for me to, you know, come back and, and tell yeah. them they're free, and I'll have moved on to 10 other things, right? So, so sometimes, after I finish, like, whatever I'm doing, I look to the side and I see, like, four or five of them, like, queued up, and then I go over to each one of them. And Neat. Make sure that all of them are attended to. Really cool. And, and yeah. any, any, any favorite books? So, we always ask any favorite books, TVs, uh, TV shows, and uh, movies of the moment that you would recommend or all time? So, for current, I think everybody, no matter how old or young, should go watch the Lego movie. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. It, it, is, it is really, really awesome, right? Okay. And uh, that word will have new meaning when you actually go and watch the show you'll understand okay uh, it's very clever very well made it has a great message as well and it's it's also so that aside right so objectively it's great if you don't believe me you can just go to rotten tomatoes it's, yeah it has a 99 percent rating right? yeah. which doesn't come up easily uh it's also something that's very close to my heart because i've been playing with lego since yeah. i was a uh, kid and that probably like was part of you know building my play habit and hobby mm -hmm. Um, so that's 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 a great movie to watch now. Of all time, I'm a big fan of the Lord of the Rings series and the Game of Thrones series as well. Uh, I read a lot of sci-fi, TV shows. Favorite all time, Game of Thrones is really good, but it's too recent to be given all time <laughs> great status. I was really into Lost. Probably The Office. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Neat. Final question. Okay. What, is, what is one uh, inspiring idea that, that, you know, one idea that you'd like to share that sort of inspires you or always, at least, you know, gets you out of bed in the morning? I'll share an idea of my, my own, which is how, what gets me out of bed every morning. Yeah. Right? So being a gamer and a game designer, right, you tend to see things in those li in that light yeah. right but like you tend to see life as a game yeah. right but it's actually the other way around right games are designed as any other art form to reflect life yeah. right and then life imitates art not if it's life right so yeah. you have that but it's true there is something very similar in the way we live our lives and the way games are designed and played right the challenges and the the complex mechanics right so and in most role-playing games, right, and life is like one of them. One of the main goals is to get as much XP as possible, right, which is experience. Yeah. And that's that's the thing for life also, right, you have you have some question mark unknown, right, number of years yeah. to play this game. You don't know where the end point is, but you know that there's an end, right, and the object of the game is not necessarily, shouldn't be to how much that coin balances at the end, yeah. right? Because that's not the score that's recorded, right? Normally what is, it's not even what, what high score is put up, but it's how much XP your character can get by the end of it. And that's how I try and look at life as well, right? Like, what can I do today to up my XP, right? Every, so every day, little by little, make sure you've done something that's 
increase that XP bar, right, that you get a little more experience at something or the other, right? and, um, and that's, that's really motivating even when, you know, you start to lose direction or focus, you just remember, wait, XP bar, I gotta, you know, make sure that that's going up, right, and so the worst situation you turn into a learning experience. And that's where I think factors into where my game design intuitions come from. Like any any bad situation, I mean, any monotonous job I'm stuck with, the first thing I try and do is turn it into a game, right? And that's then it becomes fun, right? Whether it's grading papers, whether it's like you know stapling things or whatever. Like how can I make this fun? I'm going to turn it into some kind of game, right? Yeah. And and slowly I managed to turn that silly habit into uh, a something fun. Yeah. It, it, into something that keeps me fed, right? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I, I hope that was. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, life is a game is sort of the the biggest takeaway. Yeah. Yeah. Life. Life. life is a game. Sure. <laughs> I I think that's oh, uh, the depth of that statement can be explored in yeah. many many ways. Maybe like a whole conversation. In fact, there's a very recent article that just came out that sounds really not great. Graphic designer. I drew like a whole like instruction manual for how to play life as a game. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, and he breaks it down into you know how to acquire it's basically a lot of these things that I've been thinking about and that I shared just yeah. now that and I've been thinking of many years and then somebody just put this into like uh into existence, right? Into like tangible form. And the moment the date came out, I had four different friends men message me and yeah. said, Hey, this is what you've been talking about and like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>